Hey, everybody. Good afternoon. This is Dr. Lisa. How are you today? This is happy hour with Dr. Lisa. So if you are having a bad day, I am hoping after this podcast, you will be feeling a lot better. I am available pretty much all the time. You can also call in live um, here on Podbean. So if you don't have a Podbean account and you want to talk live on the air, I am going to encourage you to get an account, find me, Dr. Lisa, and then you can talk to me um, live. Also, right now, I am live on Instagram if you want to put a face to this voice. The um, account on Instagram is at Kids Can See Ghosts. Um, can you? So try to catch me there. I am also live on Facebook. My Google voice number is 765-205-1959. You can also give me a call if you have any questions. And otherwise, these podcasts, if you miss them, are not just on Podbean, but they're also on Spotify, Pandora, YouTube, <laughs> all kinds of places. So just uh, check me out there if you miss this podcast every week. So one of the first things that I want to say to all of you listening is how much I appreciate today and also appreciated last Wednesday, all of your concern and calls and texts and emails um, regarding my mother. If you weren't listening last week, I received an emergency message from my mother to take her to the emergency room and she is fine. Thank God. She is uh at home she's well she's been going to her favorite places so she is back to normal so i just want to suggest to all of you when you feel something different with your bodies like my mother did use your instincts even if physicians tell you no sometimes we know our bodies better than they do and we listen to them and i think because my mom listened to her she is here today with me amen to that one uh, it was not something that I was ready for, as some of you have already experienced and, you know, maybe dealing with now. Uh, my heart goes out to you, but my mom is OK. Um, there was a live call last week and I didn't get to finish that call with him. And if he's there, I remember his name, but I'm not going to say it out loud unless he's here. You can call back and we can continue that conversation. All right. So one of the things that I wanted to share with all of you um, is that something that I was starting to tell you last week about child A. If you are not keeping up the, with the blogs, I'm going to encourage you to do that because um, I'm going to encourage you to do that because what I'm doing is I am alphabetizing these kids these kids come up periodically in other blogs of mine. So, for example, Child A is probably going to come up to, in uh, Friday's blog this week. And Child A is who we're talking about right now. And I am actually writing blog number 22. So once you understand these kids by reading the blogs, you'll remember, oh, Child A is the one who, you know, talked to demons and made the spider move on the window. So there'll be little things that you'll be able to remember as we get later um, into the blogs. So let's try to finish out child A to D today. And then I am going to introduce, drum roll, <laughs> child B, who is also another interesting child. So I don't know if you all remember, but I'm going to refresh you just a bit here. Um, Remember when I was talking about um, how child A wanted to go up the steps in building three, if you recall that, um, and that child saw gray smoke on the staircase? Do you remember that? Well, I wanted to share something that I was going to share last week, which I didn't, that this kid also started to see outside of building three and around the balcony and the back door. You can see me, I'm kind of using my hands so you could get a visual of what was happening. So this, this child became, um, you know, over time, extremely interesting to me because I mentioned that this was a hard 
one to deal with because this child would not stop talking about these demons. And that's what they were. They were dark angels, demon. Even this kid described them as dark and, you know, being dark angels. So pulling this one away and working with this one, teaching this kid how to, um, you know, either cope or get rid of these particular entities. This is a kid who was not on board with that. So this became really challenging for me. And over time, this is a kid who wanted me to continuously talk to these things. So remember I said I had never attempted to understand how to talk to these demons with kids because I just didn't feed into it initially. With child A, of course, I learned that this is real and that I had to start, you know, dealing with this in order to help these kids, um, you know, get through the different challenges that they were starting to face with, you know, seeing different demonic uh, spirits. And so one of the reasons, another reason why this kid became complicated is because I could not break him from it in order to teach him at least how to control, you know, the gift that was presented. This was more of an exciting playmate to this kid and to this kid's mother. It was a almost a psychic phenomena, if you will. So it's kind of like, oh, my kid can do this. You know, I told you last week that that's how that mother was. And it was in, an invitation to these, you know, dark spirits to come on in and we're excited about it and, and come on. And, um, you know, so it was not, an easy thing to deal with, even with these um, children. <sighs> yeah. So this became hard. And when the ghost did not appear to this kid, this kid would get anxious about it. Okay. This kid started having symptoms and anxiety and kind of felt safe when these things were around um, child A. So it was really difficult to manage. And I told you at the end of all of this, I actually lost child A to these entities. This kid listened to them as if they were humans telling this kid not to see me. So I lost this kid. But I want to go back for a second because you kind of know all of this already. And I want to say the things that child A talked to me about with building three were very, very dark. This wouldn't be the last time that I heard about this particular, I'm going to say ghost or dark angel that was in building three. So the way that this kid described this demon to me in building three is that it was a male presenting as male to this child, very tall, very mean and angry and would hurt me, me, human me, <laughs> Dr. Lisa, if I go back into building three. So this kid continuously, um, this kid continuously dissuaded me from entering building three. So I want you to understand this from my perspective now. We're done with child A. When, when child A terminated um, therapy, I talked to people about what this kid was saying to me and if these things were true, okay? There were I told you other people who worked there who said, oh, yeah, we know it's, it's a ghost in here and his name is so-and-so. I told you that part. Now, what they didn't share with me was kind of different than what child A shared with me. This kid told me that this was a mean demon or ghost and it didn't like me. None of them like me, just so you know. <laughs> and that this thing would hurt me. Now. What my coworkers would say is that they know about this um, ghost. 
they name this ghost. It's fine because this ghost has been here and we've been here, you know, 15, 20 years. It's never bothered us. There was one person, however, who did tell me that it bothered this person enough to move out of that building. So this was a known fact. So you see, for me, psychologically, I was hearing child A tell me these things and that these things were at my job and for me not to go into building three. However, my coworkers were confirming it like, yeah, it's here. Um, it's fine to come in here. So what did I do? <laughs> yep, you guessed it. Went into building three. So I'm going to describe it to you in a similar way that I described it into my blog, but I'm going to show you with my hands a little bit if you can see me so you'll understand which direction I'm walking and stuff like that. So in this um, building, which was, I found out back in the day, a one to had different apartments in it kind of like a um a two flat or a brownstone you guys on the east coast a brownstone so when you walk into the back door you are in the kitchen and the kitchen was i'm not gonna say it was bright not even as bright as the room if you can see my room my room i'm in right now and i'm in a basement this was a kitchen that was um like a lime green color so that color alone made it brighter there was a window over to the left and you walk in and you can see um the living room in that hallway in between the kitchen and the living room you can go right and go up the steps okay that staircase is where child a saw the gray smoke so I have to go in this building because I was going to go on maternity leave. Um, it was, oh gosh, it had to be, this had to be around roughly October 2012 because the baby was due in December. So I had to go into the building and I did. And I noticed uh, it was just not a, it was not clean, if you will, meaning not dirty, not nasty, but heavy. So I felt like this heaviness on my chest. And at the time, I remember thinking, well, I'm like, I have this beach ball in my belly. So I probably am, you know, kind of breathing harder, which makes sense if you think about pregnant women in reality, especially like five, six weeks away from, you know, giving birth. So I'm walking up the steps and I remember grabbing, I always grab the handrail. Because remember, these, these kids would get into my head about things. So I was very aware of the possibility of something happening. But in reality, I'm like, no ghost can defeat me. You know, I don't even know if this stuff is real. And I'm not scared of it. You know, I'm never scared of haunted houses, except Jason. I don't like Jason. You know, Jason from the horror films, I can't stand him. He's scary. But anyway, I go up the steps and turn in my paperwork. All good, right? Okay. Come back out the house. There, Don't quote me on this because I don't remember. There were at least six to eight steps on the back. And something pushed me down those steps. Out back. Yep. I felt it. It pushed me in my back cave then. But for some reason, I didn't fall. Now, if you push a pregnant woman as hard as I was pushed, she should fall because your equilibrium is off. I didn't fall. What happened to me was I was pushed and something pushed back. So some of you saw that. So I was pushed like in my back and something pushed me back. And I kid you not, I should have fallen on the ground. And I thought, what the hell was that? And I looked up at the back of the building and thought about child A. And I was like, okay, maybe I have on the wrong shoes. Maybe that kid was right. Maybe I shouldn't have gone in the building. <sighs> Enter child be. Let's talk about this baby. If you have questions about child A, make sure you let me know. 
you can type them or you can put them on Facebook or Instagram and I will answer you. Child B. This is one of my favorite stories. <laughs> Let me give you a little background about this little one. Some of you ask me questions about gender. Some ask about religion. Some ask about race. I don't typically share those details, but because I know for some reason it's important to some of you, I'm going to share with you this point about child B. This was an African-American family. Okay. So again, I saw a variety of different kids. And again, this was community health. So you just pull whoever you can off the list. So these were random children. This was not word of mouth. So enter child B. Child B was an interesting one because this was the first family that I met where all of them could see ghosts. Every last one of them. Yep. And child B was coming to see me for therapy. Therapy because this little one was having a lot of concerns behaviorally in school. And the parents were concerned. These parents right off the bat told me that this kid can see ghosts and that they could too, which shocked me. You can imagine why it shocked me because my thought was, I'm sorry about that. That was my bracelet. Here we go again, right? And what do I do? So I should just focus on the mental health because I don't know what else to do. Right. So. We were getting to know one another. And another surprise that I had was that the father could see ghosts. Now, I don't talk about fathers too much because they don't always share with me if they can see ghosts. Fathers are different. They're a lot more. They're, they're guarded. They're even guarded with mental health. Some of them. And especially with their boys, it's really difficult for them, some of them to think about something being challenged with their little boys, especially African-American men. So he was he was different. I mean, he was talkative and, you know, was excited that they can share this with someone. And I, I remember him as if it was yesterday. He had a different kind of gift. It was I don't even know what it's called. But this man could see everything that had happened on the piece of land where I worked, which was different for me. And I'm getting to that. Child B was a dreamer, had vivid dreams. Child B could see spirits. Child B's mother could also see spirits. And she would go outside a lot while I was working with child B because she started figuring out what was going on in all of the buildings, including a building that I don't talk about because it was not affiliated with my job, but it was a fourth building. Okay. A fourth one that child B's mother told me all about. <laughs> so this was a pretty, um, a pretty cool family. So child B needed to work on, you know, behaviors. She was, she was not behaving well. This was a female. She was not behaving well in school, not at all. So we had oppositional behavior. So talking back to teachers, this was a kid who was being defiant. So not listening, you know, cursing in school. I mean, she was one of my babies. I like to work with kids like that. So on top of being oppositional and on top of being defiant, this is a child who would see spirits and talk to them all the time. This was also a family who, when they engaged with me, always wanted to tell me what's around me all the time. And we'll always talk about, you know, what was haunting the building or what was haunting the land. It There were a lot of things that this family told me. So there's a lot to unpack. So this may be a podcast for like the next three to four um, hours. So 
uh, when I meet kids, I always start out with a clinical interview. Okay, remember that? So in this interview, this was different because these families were interviewing me and I never forgot that. And I started to welcome that after this family did that because you do want to get to know about your therapist. Okay, so in that interview, this these kids like to sit very close to me. So this was another one who would always sit very close to me. So we were in in the in the interview stage, the struck we call it a structured clinical interview. And this was a kid who started talking about an angel behind me. And so um child A had not really talked to me. Child A could see what was around me, but never really talked about it. So this was one of the first times that I dealt with, you know, child. Uh, B. So I asked, what's behind me? There's an angel behind you, a really tall angel. She and, and I would ask questions like, what's she doing behind me? And the mother would chime in and say, she's your angel. She's your angel. She protects you. She will always protect you. She's always been with you. Now I'm sitting there stunned, looking around. Like, well, where is she? And I'm glad. Maybe that's why I didn't get in a car accident. You know, I'm making light of it, but they're being very serious with me. And so um, this was the first time that I was able to get, I'm I'm pointing behind me because, you know, apparently, you know, she's always supposed to be behind me. And so this was the first time that, you know, I really had the opportunity um, to really get into detail because at that point I started getting really curious because this was not the first kid to tell me about entities that were around me. So apparently I'll just tell you real quick and I'm going to actually write a long blog about, you know, the angel behind me because that's what I call her. Um, She's behind me. She's always with me and she would talk to child B all the time during my sessions, which blew me away. What also blew me away is that I talked about the angel in the tree. Child B would also talk about the angel in the tree. And the angel in the tree was male, according to child B. And this angel would tell little funny things to kids about me and my life. And there was no way that these kids would know these things because I don't share those personal private things with my clients. So I'm perplexed now because like there really is something out there um, in the tree trying to prove to me that it's real by way of child B. So I'm like, holy crap, wow, you know. So this angel in the tree was also always guarding me, according to child B. This one guarded me outside where I am. So he's supposed to be outside like now, no matter where I am, according to child B. So you understand this relationship, this therapeutic relationship got really deep with um, child B and family. So while we were doing the interview, one of the things that I learned from child B is that this kid would see dark angels. This was another kid who called dark spirits um, dark angels. So this is another kid who was who said to me, dark angels follow me at school. And I'm like, OK, so what happens when you go to school? And I will never forget this kid said, I do what it says. I do what it says. I do what they say. I talk to them. I do what they say. So if they tell me to hit a girl, I go hit her. If they tell me to fight on the bus, I fight on the bus. If they tell me to throw an apple at my teacher's head, I throw an apple at my teacher's head. But on the flip side, and this is going to sound really strange. 
strange coming from me after hearing all of this. This was the nicest child to me, toward me, and was very respectful of her parents. And it just blew me away. So this is one of those cases where you have a kid who misbehaves in one environment and not the other which is always a ding, 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 kind of something else is going on moment, probably for most child psychologists, because consistency is what we look for. This child was not being consistent. This child was not consistently misbehaving. So we had to really work to get to the bottom of what was going on. So I met child B when we were still in building one. I don't remember how many kids I would see at once because some of the kids I tested, this was not a kid that I conducted testing with. So I was actually seeing child A and child B around the same time. B just lasted longer and child A, I actually tested psychologically. B loved to come and see me. This kid had an affinity toward just telling me everything, including the times when she would dream about me because she would dream about me. So I had my work cut out for me because here was a kid, the first one who was misbehaving at the hands of some entity, okay? I know now what to do. Back then, I was learning. So what was interesting is that when these things would follow child B to school, the parents could see them do it. Parents could see them do it. So imagine your kid getting on the bus and you can see a dark angel following your kid on the bus. Now, I don't have the ability to see, but these parents did. So they were very forthright with telling me the things that they saw happening to this kid, to their child, and then also um, what they do to try to fight. The one thing that they did not do was to, man to demand these entities to go away. The one thing they didn't do as well is to demand them to go away in God's name. Again, it doesn't matter if you believe or God or not. I'm telling you what worked. And that work every time for kids going forward that open their eyes and their ears and their spirituality to it. And that's not to push religion off of anybody. But what I'm saying to you is that it worked. OK, so that was the missing piece. But that takes time to deal with with families, especially families who may not believe that those things will make a difference. This family did, they just didn't do it. So with them, there was a sense of pride in all of them being able to see these things as well. What was happening though, mimicked the mother because the mother used to tell me that when she was little, the same thing happened to her and she would misbehave just like child B because she didn't quote unquote have control of her gift. So it's really important to try to help these kids control their gifts, okay? And, and it turned out that it was really important for me to teach these parents how to control them too, okay? So child B was gonna be a piece of work <laughs> and I loved every minute of it, man. So I'm gonna skip a little bit and just give you an idea of some other things that child B and family would see once we move to building two. So all of the initial information I just told you about child B, I found out when I was still in building one, okay? Remember I moved to building two with child A, and then we also moved to building two when I had child B. Child B would lose her crap in building two, period, point blank. And I didn't know why. Upon entry to this building, child B would get so much anxiety. And I would stand there down the steps 
and go and get this kid and family and have to do some uh, de-escalation of child B's worry behaviors. Um, This was a kid who had become very anxious, like wouldn't go to the bathroom (laughs) without the mom or me just standing outside the door. Um, When you came, let's see, is that the front door or the back door? I believe it was the front door of building two. Then you walked in the front door, the staircase was right there. And then when you went to the right, there was the waiting area. It's a very beautiful building. Um, From the waiting area, if you make a left and go down the hallway, there was a bathroom and the office where the um, office manager who would check the, the clients in was over there. This kid would not go down the hallway. And so when it was time to go to my office, this kid didn't disobey. This kid would fly up the steps. I'm like, what is going on with this baby? So the mother would walk behind me, kind of sh- shaking her head, kind of giggling. And I'm like, you know, I what is happening? Because I don't know. Now, I want you to understand, I noticed the pattern of kids being anxious in this building. Now, this would be, if, if my old boss was listening right now, this would not be new news to her because I talked to her about this the whole time. You know, this was back in 2012. So they were all very aware of my growing anxiety because I'm like, what's happening to my clients when they come in this building? Child B would fly up those steps and turn and go down the hallway and go straight to my office. And so finally, this kid would get calm in my office. And I'm like, hey, you guys tell me, you know, what's happening? Because I don't know. You know, I'm all peachy, keen, happy. Hey! And then, boom, this kid is gone. So I'm like, what, what's happening in the building? So here we go. Okay. Child B said there's a little spirit boy running around the building. And I'm like, a little spirit boy. What does that mean? What does that mean? And they're like, the mother goes, oh, it's just a little tiny little spirit boy. He's just like running and running. And a lot of times when you go get child A, the little spirit boy is behind you. And I'm like, me? (laughs) Why is this little spirit boy behind me? And the mother is like, I think he feels safe around you. And I'm like, me? But why is it frightening to child B If this is a safe, there's nothing safe about that if it's frightening. And they said, this little spirit boy used to live in this building. And this little spirit boy is still in this building and is running up and down the hallway. And so I said, well, the, what is the, why, what is the anxious behavior coming from? Why is it nervous? And child B is like, I just sometimes get nervous around, you know, certain entities and this one makes me nervous. So my office was a very safe place because I said, well, you know, what, what do we need to do to make you feel safe, you know, to decrease some of the feelings you have. And and I remember this day was bright, you know, they child B was sit close to me, but you know, anyway, child B would say, no, your office feels clean. It feels safe. It, it can't come in here. So if you follow my blogs, multiple kids have told me that. And I'll tell you why it's because I always cleanse my office at, at dealing with this for so many years. I learned to cleanse my office in prayer, right? And so child B would tell me, well, you have angels in your office and outside guarding you. And so I'm so dumb. I'm like, oh, really? Cool. I did pray. So they're really here. Right. And they're like, yeah. And I'm like, well, where do you see them? And child B would go everywhere. That's why I run to your office. And I'm like, okay. 
So this kid would tell me that the little spirit boy wouldn't come in my office, which to me meant that this was a dark angel. Okay. Where did it come from? You'll learn about that around October. That's a whole month to tell you about that. However, this was a little spirit that frightened a lot of kids just running around when they would come into the building. And so child B was one of them. So eventually we had to start taking therapy outside. Like I would literally meet them outside or we would come into my office for a little while. And then I would take the family outside um, because it felt safe to child B. Child B would not want to go to the bathroom even on the second floor. In my blog, I may have said I was on the third floor and then I corrected it in a blog after that and said, no, it was actually on the, I was on the second floor off in the corner. And so, um, you know, the, I had to, we had these, um, silencers outside our door because what we talk about is confidential. So my very intelligent former boss used to put these silencers outside our door to make sure that no one could hear what was going on. And so that was on, the door was closed and this kid would not budge out of my care, period. Off limits, would hold her pee. <laughs> not going out there. Okay. So in my mind, I'm like, well, should I be scared too? <laughs> Cause I don't know what this kid sees because I don't see. Right. So we were, you know, still very early in our therapeutic relationship. Um, and so that's the stage of getting to know clients and them getting to know me. And so one of the things that I learned from that moment was that I had to either make a change and get a new job elsewhere to treat these kids, or I had to figure out what to do, you know? So the way that we would get child B out the door. Now, let me back up. We would always have to start therapy with, decreasing child B's symptoms of anxiety because of the little spirit boy and other things that this kid would see. And then we would have to always end it with preparing child B to leave my care. Now, this was not a defiant kid toward me, just I don't want to go out there. Eventually, I found out that there were more things that child B was afraid of. For example, Child B, and there was another one that told me in the staircase they could see a dark angel with really big wings that was very terrifying and dark, and they didn't want to go down the stairs. So eventually I found out more things, okay? But in the moment, it was the little spirit boy. So I would get Child B out the building safely in the car, and then the routine was... I would walk them outside too and get them in the car because this kid would cling to me. And I never understood why this child was so clingy toward me. And it was inappropriate clingy. It was just a little odd because this was a new kid under my care. And you'll find out later why this kid was so clingy toward me because I found out later on why. Um, anyway, so we would actually walk outside and we when we would get outside, they would giggle because apparently my angels would be talking to them. Like my angel told child B's mother once that I was being stupid <laughs> in college. Now, there was no way that child B's family would know that about me. I didn't tell them I was being stupid in college. Why would you tell a, a family of yours under your care that you're being stupid in college? And I said, well, what does that mean? Coming from an angel 
And she's and Child B's mother said, well, she said she left you for a while because you were being stupid in college. And then when you started to get smart again, she came back. So they don't protect you, apparently, when you're being stupid. <laughs> That's what they told me. So conversations like that would happen when these this family would leave me. And so, you know, one day I'm going to share this with you. We were standing in the parking lot and child B's father was there too. And child B told me not to go into building three. What is it with building three again? Right? So do not go into building three without telling them anything I knew. I said, why? That's my job. Our administrators are in there. I'm getting ready to have a baby. I'm going to have to go in there. This was after I was pushed. Okay? Keep that up here. This was after I was pushed. Child B said, there's a, a, a demon in there. There's a dark angel and it hates you. And I said, well, damn, in my head, child A told me that too. But I didn't say anything. I said, what do you mean? Because remember, when you talk to other clients, it's confidential. So I don't share what I talk to with other clients, amongst clients, if that makes sense. The mother said to me, ooh, I'll never forget that day. She said, ooh. Oh, you can't go in there. And the father looked up at the door and said, it's just standing in the door. You don't see it. And I'm like, no. And they're like, it's standing in the door. Don't go in there. It is mad at you. The mother said, you need to use the spiritual side of you. And I'm like, well, what's that? And she said, look at the door and look at it and release your mind and look at it. It is glaring at you like it wants to hurt you. And I said, I don't see it. And she said, you have to use your spiritual mind. I said, maybe I don't have one. I mean, because I don't see it. But she said, don't go in the building because it wants to hurt you. And then she turned me around and she said, I want you to always remember that demons will hurt you. My kid sees demons. I see demons. She's still holding my shoulders. Do not go into the building. So I said, I've already been in there, right? Thinking I'm wise and smart, right? You know, I'm so book smart. <laughs> She's like, why did you go in there? And I said, well, I had to. She said, don't go in there again. She said, it will hurt you. She said, and I quote, weren't you pushed down the steps? <laughs> I swear to God, all of this is true. And I said, Yes, what pushed me down the steps? Him. And I said, why did it push me down the steps? And she said, it does not like you because you talk to angels. That would not be the last time I heard about that. So I said, um, Oh, oh, well, I'm going to keep talking to angels. And so she said, don't go in there. She said, that's a demon who's been there for a long time. Your coworkers see it. I said, they told me. And we're all standing outside. So these are the four buildings, courtyard and stuff in between the buildings, sidewalk, parking lot. We're on the steps. And not the stairs, the um, sidewalk talking. And the four of us and child B grabs me and, it, and I, it was so hot and I was so pregnant. And I remember feeling um, just really, really um, hot, like I didn't want anybody to touch me. And I think I was also irritated because I had been told again to not go into that building. And in my brain, I couldn't comprehend it. So... Child B said, I don't want anything to happen to you. Don't go in the building. That thing 
is not good. It's really angry. It's harmed children before. It's, it, it, har it harms children. It has a long time ago. <sighs> so the dad said to me, this whole land is haunted. This entire land used to be that building was a place that housed children when the fathers would go off to war. And that home was owned by a male and this male would be in charge of these children like a foster home. And the mom said, ooh, she said, I can see a spirit of a kid falling to the ground. And at this point I'm, I'm kind of looking at them like I'm looking at all of you. And I said, who pushed the child? And she said, he did. Back then, there were no child abuse laws. So they just killed children just because. And so I said, so are you saying that when people die, their spirits say, stay? And she said, no, there's no purgatory period. This just, just There was an evil person there. Some people call demons to them, right? And there's a demon who stayed. And I said, oh, my goodness, but I thought you said, and she said, I did. The person who lived there murdered people, murdered children. People who murder have what? And she said, evil spirits. That's what's there. And it will hurt you because it's hurt people before. She said, that's what demons do. So are you blown away? Because I was. Because this was really early in developing the relationship with Child B's family. So after therapy, that's the kind of stuff that I learned just standing in the parking lot on the sidewalk with this family. And there's so, I have my eyes closed because there are so many visions that I remember and conversations like that. I don't even have to look at my notes with this family. So you know what I did? Not only, I didn't just talk to my coworkers this time, I actually went to archives in St. Louis, historical archives. And I wrote all this in a blog, so I'm not gonna bore you with it, to find out if this stuff was true about the land and the building and I want you all to know too that I'm not a native, excuse me, of St. Louis. I'm actually an Ohioan. And so I had no knowledge about this at all. Why would I? So I go and I start asking questions. I look up, um, you know, the history. I'm just intrigued by, you know, some of the conversations like that that I had with Child B. And so I contact historians in the area and this particular township, I don't know if it's called a township, but it's in the city of St. Louis. And so I started studying this stuff. Now, I also have always talked about these things with people for years. I just never told them to the public until now. And so the people such as my graduate students. So every ha Halloween, you know, I talked about how I tell this story about building three because it's absolutely true, okay? And one Halloween, and I believe it was 2000, my class, I had fall of 2018. I told them the story that I'm gonna tell you all in October that has a lot to do with child B. And so my students are like, oh yeah, this area is completely haunted. We completely believe you. And I'm like, what do you mean? And they said, oh, that area is known for its hauntings. I used to have an apartment there and we had a ghost in our apartment, which is why we moved. And another one, Oh, we had an apartment there and my boyfriend had an apartment there moved because there were ghosts in the hallway and knocking on stuff. And 
So I'm the professor, right? <laughs> so I'm looking like they believe me and I'm glad because this stuff actually happened to me. So one of the students said, when you get a chance, just Google Ikea and what they found under Ikea in the city of St. Louis. And so when, next time you go to Ikea, I want you to think about what I'm telling you about the area being haunted. So what did I do? I always, I'm always a researcher. I went and I looked at what happened with Ikea because what my students told me is that this particular part of St. Louis was built many, many moons ago on burial ground. <laughs> and so it is no secret about the hauntings in these, this area where I worked, but I did not know. So I go and I Google Ikea. Now my job wasn't next to Ikea, but they were just giving me an example of how, why they believe me. So I go and I Google Ikea. And you know what I found out? That during construction, they did find skeletons under the ground of Ikea. Yep, if you're in St. Louis, they did. You can Google it. And so I was like, oh my gosh. <laughs> These kids are telling me the truth about these things because I also found out that the dad was right about that building and the dad was correct about the land and the dad was correct about a man owning it. <laughs> so you see, this is why I started really researching to figure out how to help these kids, because these kids told me the truth. And wait till I tell you about the little spirit boy. <laughs> oh, man, these kids were great. And so I laugh a lot because I know it's unbelievable to so many people. When these kids do find the time to come to you and to tell you that they are seeing ghosts, even if you can't see them, I want you to believe them. And if you have questions about it, make sure you ask me. Okay. We are going to end child B there. There's a lot to pick up with child B. I am going to spend the last section, sex, I'm sorry, session of this podcast um, answering a question that I received today from a parent. Okay. And because of this question, I decided to write a blog about recommendations for parents if you have kids that see ghosts. And this parent was very concerned about her son being able to see ghosts, how to make it go away. And I don't know how to make the ability to see ghosts going away. That's not my, my job and I can't, I can't do that. Okay, but what I can tell you is how to help them cope better, how to sleep at night. I want you all to know that this gets really serious for parents because not only are their kids up at night, they're up at night too and they're exhausted, okay? Especially if they can't see ghosts or know how to demand them to go away. So for that mom, if she's listening, I want you to know that you have the authority as well as the power with your child to make these go away. And that is how you control it. I know plenty of, plenty of adults who told me they still see ghosts as adults, but it's when they want to, for the most part. So if one enters the room, they know how to tell it to go away. And what they've taught me to do over the years and what um, I would like for, to share with you that you can do is that whether you believe in God or not, the way to deal with this is to demand them to go away in God's name. They have to listen to you when you do it that way. That is how I taught kids over time to control their gifts. Because whether you want to believe it or not, it is a gift. It is a gift. But when they constantly see demons, that is not a good thing because it is very hurtful 
and harmful to all of us, actually, because they're not our friends. So a lot of people want to be friend demons. You know, they want to use Ouija boards and call them. Somebody calls them, you know. I'll say I said it before and I'll say it again. Don't call things that you don't understand because you may not be able to get rid of them. And the same goes for playing with Ouija boards and other things that can be ways to bring them into your lives. However, if they come, you can't get rid of them. Okay. Demand them to go away and they will, but you have to do it in God's name. Okay. All right. So if you have any questions, make sure you let me know. Otherwise, thank you so much for joining my podcast today. And I look forward to talking to child B next week. You all have a good night. Thank you again. Bye-bye.